You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is May 21st, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, bronchial pulmonary aspergillosis. Our presenter is Dr. Amanda Grobel. She's a pediatric resident at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Welcome to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is May 21st, 2012. Uh, we have uh, two, actually three conferences today. Uh, we're going to first be hearing a, uh, a brief lecture on bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Uh, then uh, Dr. Chacho will be discussing IgE-mediated immune responses, and maybe she'll tell us what the E and IgE stands for. Uh, and then uh, uh, a little bit later, we'll be joined by Dr. Leonard Bailery from uh, uh, New Jersey. He's at uh, Rutgers, and he'll be talking with us about complementary and alternative uh, medicine as it applies to allergies. And we certainly see a lot of that in the allergy uh, profession. So uh, I'm not going to uh, belabor any of this. I will go ahead and turn the uh, podium over to Dr. Chacho, who will introduce our first uh, speaker. Great. So uh, this is Amanda Grable. She is uh, one of the interns here at, uh, actually I said that wrong, she's Grable. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. She's okay. Grable around here too. Amanda Grable is a, um, a first year intern here in the, the Department of Pediatrics, uh, rotating with us, doing a fantastic job so far, and she's going to talk about allergic bronchial pulmonary acidosis. All right. So I'm going to talk about ABPA, which is um, a lung disease that you see in um, usually people with asthma and cystic fibrosis. You can use the wheel or the arrows on the keyboard. Okay. Um, so first of all, what is ABPA? Because I hadn't actually heard about it until a couple months ago when I was on the pulmonology inpatient team. So it's a hypersensitivity reaction in the lungs um, due to the mold aspergillus fumigatus, which is actually present everywhere. Um, we all have this floating around in our lungs, but some people um, react to it more. Um, and what they get is chronic, uh, chronic inflammation um, that's kind of episodic and eventually leads to bronchial obstruction. They can eventually get bronchiectasis, um, fibrosis, and decreased pulmonary function testing. And um, like I said, you mostly see it in people who have some kind of underlying lung disease, such as asthma or cystic fibrosis most commonly. It's estimated to be at about 1% to 2% of asthma patients, although we know that it's underdiagnosed because it hasn't really been very well understood until the past several years. And when you're actually seeing asthma specialty clinics or asthma patients that are hospitalized, it's been reported up to 15 to 30%. And then in cystic fibrosis, you will tend to see it in about 1% to 15%, and it um, tends to increase as people get older, but you will see it in a lot of children that have CF. Um, the pathophysiology is not really very well understood. Um, like I said, the aspergillus is ubiquitous. It's in the environment. We're breathing it in all the time. And most people are colonized, but they're able to clear it without any problems, and even people with um, other underlying disease don't always get ABPA. We know that it has something to do with in the patients who get it have increased circulating IgG and IgE specific to the aphemogatis, and this causes a hypersensitivity reaction. Um, T cells also have an increased response to this, and they make um, several different interleukins, which leads to increased eosinophilia and increased IgE, so it's kind of a cycle. Um, but the exact total pathway is not completely understood. And then despite the vigorous immune response that patients get, the immune system can't actually clear the fungus, and so it's just kind of a vicious cycle with it always sitting there and causing inflammation. So what you'll see in patients who have asthma, a lot of times it's just increased asthma symptoms. So increased wheezing, coughing, dyspnea. They'll also have episodes of fever and malaise. They may have increased mucus plugging compared to others. You can sometimes see pulmonary consolidation or, or infiltrates on chest x-ray, and it can kind of mimic pneumonia sometimes. And then later on in the disease, you see bronchiectasis and severe air trapping. And once you get to that point, you've already had some irreversible damage. So this is just um, a picture that I took out of an article from CHEST that shows that you can get this 
pulmonary um, kind of opacity. And then in this patient, it really just went away on its own without any antibiotics. And so what you kind of think, want to think about is if there's a patient who has an atypical pneumonia or something that's an infiltrate that kind of gets better or goes away, and it's not just the typical presentation of asthma. And then these are some high-resolution CTs of patients who are further down the, down the road with EBPA. Um, you can see here a lot of dilated bronchi um, with bronchiectasis and then some um, kind of congestion down in this lobe. This is another patient that has just this giant mucus plug sitting here um, that's actually just as dense as the bone. Um, and like I said, these are pretty late findings, but it's one of the ways CT with diagnosis of central bronchiectasis is one of the ways of diagnosing ABPA. And then the clinical features that you see in CF are actually just similar to a primary CF exacerbation. You know, the, um, the increased coughing, increased mucus, um, but they don't usually get better with the traditional CF treatments of antibiotics or airway clearance. So this might be a patient who comes in with what looks like a CF exacerbation, they get a week of treatment with antibiotics that normally would make them better, but then they just don't get better. And because the symptoms can look so similar, a lot of CF centers will just regularly test for EBPA now. And it's kind of one of their um, diagnostic treatment endpoints. So to diagnose EBPA, you really have to have a high clinical suspicion because the symptoms early on can be so similar to just regular asthma or CF exacerbations. It may just look like severe asthma or recurrent asthma. Um, re acutely, it can look like pneumonia, like I showed on that x-ray. And then you definitely want to consider it in patients who are actually hospitalized or especially in the ICU with asthma. There was one study of ICU patients with asthma that showed at least a 39% prevalence of ABPA. So it's just something that if you don't think about it, you may not ever see it. We know that it's pretty underdiagnosed. Um, there are some reports in other countries of 10 years between the symptom onset and di the actual diagnosis, just looking back at the symptoms people have had. And early diagnosis and treatment are really important to preventing the permanent lung damage, um, because once you actually see the bronchiectasis and fibrosis, um, there's been permanent damage. So really, you want to. There's more and more recommendations now for routine screening for this in patients with asthma and CF. Um, the first step in diagnosis is the aspergillus skin prick test, and then after that you can do total serum IgE and specific testing for the aspergillus. And the diagnostic criteria are slightly different between asthma and CF. So um, this is, again, a table that I took from um, the immunology, the asthma immunology book. But um, you can see that the positive skin test is part of the diagnosis in both of them. And then serum IgE and asthma, um, it's just a little bit of a difference in the um, actual number. But you definitely want to look at total serum IgE. And then the specific um, aspergillus. In asthma, you can diagnose it with central bronchiectasis. And if you don't see this, it's just called seropositive EBPA. So they still have the disease, but it's just a little bit of a different classification. And then peripheral eosinophilia is important. And then the other main difference you see here is that first on the list with CF is the actual clinical deterioration that's just not their typical CF course. There's not another cause for it. So the treatment goal is really to control the inflammation and prevent the progressive lung injury. Um, as soon as there's a diagnosis of it, you want to start, system, of course, the systemic glucocorticoids. What I thought is usually a two-week course of oral prednisone um, for an acute flare and then a 30-day taper. And the way that you monitor treatment response is usually by serum total IgE. And then inhaled steroids, um, even though they're useful in treatment, treating actual asthma, they're not useful for treating the ABPA. The studies have not shown any benefit. So it really has to be systemic prednisone. Um, Itraconazole is another um, adjuvant therapy. So it's an antifungal that increases the clinical response to the steroids, but it's not used on its own. Really, it's just been shown to show to allow a faster taper of the steroids and less need for the steroids in the future. Um, Boriconazole is another antifungal that's been used with some benefit. Um, and that one, there's, there haven't been quite as many studies as there have been for the itraconazole. And this seems to work in two different ways. For one way, it's the antifungal. It reduces the, floating, the fungus floating around, reduces antigens, and it's been shown to reduce the serum specific, the aspergillus specific antibodies. And then it also impairs the body's metabolism of glucocorticoids, which gives you higher plasma levels of the steroids. And that can allow a faster taper. So it's good, but it push, puts patients at risk for Cushing syndrome because then they've got higher steroids for the dose that you're giving them. And 
some patients have actually had adrenal insufficiency because um, they're suppressing the body's actual metabolism of it. And then omalizumab is um, a monoclonal antibody against the IgE that um, has shown some benefit in children with CF. It hasn't only really been investigated in ABPA and other patients with CF, but it's definitely something that um, is showing that it might be useful in the future. Um, the prognosis of ABPA is still pretty unclear, and it varies among different people. There is kind of a staging system that um, mainly is just you have an acute flare that gets treated, you go into remission, and then some patients progress on to further stages where they um, still have relapses and then possible chronic lung disease. Um, but the most important thing with prognosis is that early intervention is important to prevent the progression. So um, just to summarize, ABPA is a hypersensitivity reaction to the aspergillus mold, usually seen in patients with asthma or CF, and it leads to recurrent inflammation and eventually can lead to bronchiectasis and fibrosis. You diagnose it mainly by clinical presentation and then using skin prick testing to aspergillus um, theorem IgE and then specific antibodies. You treat it with systemic glucocorticoids and possibly antifungals. And then um, early recognition and treatment are really important, and you need to consider it in patients who have recurrent asthma or CF that's not responding to therapy. So those are Any questions? Yeah. Oh, very good. Thank, Thank you very much. I was wondering if immunotherapy to aspergillus had any advantages. I don't know if that's ever looked at, but yeah. it's like it's like it's like they said that they didn't think it was. It wouldn't have to mask talk on it, and there wasn't a lot of benefit. But they, they had it hasn't been looked at? No. I mean, one question was always, is it harmful to give immunotherapy? Because you're already making all this IgG to aspergillus, so you immunize them with aspergillus. Is it going to make it worse? Mm -hmm. It turns out it doesn't seem to make it worse, so it's not contraindicated. Uh, and if you're allergic to the aspergillus, it may help your allergy symptoms. <clears throat> but what I've always wondered, and, and I don't think it's totally clear, is um, this: you've got this massive amount of IgE and this massive amount of IgG to aspergillus. And are those antibodies causing the disease, or are they markers for it? And is there some other underlying mechanism that actually causes the damage? And I don't, I've not been able to get a satisfactory answer to that. Maybe it's not around. I don't know. I don't know that. I mean, if you get rid of the IgG, I don't know how you do that. I mean, does the omalizumab really help? Because you're getting rid of the IgE when you give them yeah. omalizumab. People have strong, well, I took of on omalizumab. People have strong feelings about maybe PA. Yeah. 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 Some people are way. Like, no way. <laughs> yeah. I'm not interested in feelings. What is the evidence? Yeah. Show because everybody has feelings. Great evidence about it because it's such a rare disease. And if I have a disease, I don't care what my doctor's feelings are. I want to know what. <laughs> uh, Brock, what did you want to say? Oh, I, I was just kind of curious if you can uh, differentiate uh, between farmer's lung and ABPA. Or are they the same thing? Farmer's lung, which would be aspergillus exposure that farmers have when they're working in the in the fields or with hay. Mm -hmm. And then they get this hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But do they get IgE also? I think it's just an, I think it's just HSP. Yeah. It also okay. be the timing. The ABPA folk are more randomly just going to flare that we know of. We certainly haven't been able to detect that they're getting exposed to aspergillus. Whereas you would expect a farmer's lung to improve if they if they stop farming. Stop. stop <laughs> they both can have both positive precipitate, <clears throat> but I think that. You're not going to see the IgE in the level of eosinophilia. Mm. But you're right, very, very similar. Because it was on mm. I wonder if you can get that by playing Farmville. No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Farmville. Very good. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very um, this is one, one of those diseases I always thought was puzzling. Uh, John Salviaggio used to study this. and. Uh, one comment was made that more people study the disease than who actually have the disease. <laughs> but my guess is that, because we used to look for it all the time and never found it, and I guess now finding it, maybe, I don't know if the prevalence is higher than it used to be, or if our tests are just more sensitive. I suspect a combination of the, of the two. But very, very interesting, and thank you for this uh, review. This has been an ACAAI production.
To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.